Hello, my name is Caleb Smith. I am an Erlanger children's nurse on the acute care floor and today I will be discussing diabetes education. Welcome. Thank you for choosing the pediatric diabetes program at Children's Hospital at Erlanger. We recognize this may be a difficult and scary time for your family. Finding out that your child has been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes can be frightening and overwhelming. Know that you're not alone in your struggle. Please know that we will do our best to make this transition as easy as possible. Children with type 1 diabetes and their families go through a tremendous learning experience. The good news is that kids are adaptable and type 1 diabetes is manageable. With preparation and understanding, kids with type 1 diabetes can lead happy, normal lives. Our goal is to work with the family to determine the best treatment options for each patient and to facilitate success in living with this condition. Every year, we help numerous children and families adjust to living with diabetes so that they can continue leading full, active lives. This book is the first step toward the management of diabetes. While you are in the hospital, you will learn the basic skills you will need to manage your child's blood sugars before you go home. After discharge, you will follow up in the endocrinologist's office the following business day and receive more detailed education from the diabetes educator. Your appointment will be scheduled before you are discharged. Please remember that you are never alone. There is someone on call 24 hours a day if you have any questions or problems with which you might need help. Your team. Your care team is made up of pediatric endocrinologists, pediatric residents, a nurse practitioner, a certified diabetes educator, dietitian, and pediatric nurses. We work as a team to help families gain the knowledge and skills necessary for managing diabetes. You're encouraged to let us know about any concerns you may have with your child's health, development, or care at any time. Listed below are our physicians, our nurse practitioner, our diabetes educator, and our pediatric nurses. How to reach us? Appointments can be made at 423-778-5437. For non-urgent issues, general questions, and laboratory results, please call 423-778-5437 or send us a message through my chart. For prescriptions, call your pharmacy and ask them to send an electronic prescription refill request to us. Please allow 48 hours for your prescription refills. To fax, you can use 423-778-5537. Two, two. For school, camp, and sport forms, please ask the school nurse or camp to fax us their forms. Allow five business days to complete. If your child is sick or has ketones, please call 423-778-5437. This is also our emergency beeper number after hours. In case of any emergency, call 911. If your child has severe low blood sugar and requires glucagon, please call 911. Our locations include Children's Endocrinology Kennedy Outpatient Center at 900 East 3rd Street, Chattanooga, Tennessee 37403 and at Erlinger East Hospital located at 1635 Gun Barrel Road, Physician Building C, Suite 410, Chattanooga, Tennessee 37421. Both locations can be reached through our main phone number at 423-778-5437. Day 1. So what is diabetes? Diabetes is a chronic condition that develops when the body no longer produces enough insulin or the insulin it makes does not work effectively. Insulin is a hormone produced by the pancreas that allows your body to use sugars from the foods you eat. Think of insulin as the key that unlocks the cell, allowing sugar to enter the cell and be used as energy. Without insulin, sugar cannot enter the cells in your body and cells begin to starve. Your body will work to break down fat for energy. When fat is used for energy, an acid called ketones is produced as a byproduct. Excess ketones will make you very sick. If ketones become excessive, it can lead to a life-threatening condition called diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA. Type 1 diabetes. 
In type 1 diabetes, the pancreas releases little or no insulin. The body's immune system turns against itself in type 1 diabetes, destroying the pancreas cells that produce insulin. If you look to the figure on the bottom left, it shows insulin as a key to the cell. Insulin, again, is a key that unlocks the cell. It allows sugar to enter the cell and be used as energy. The classic symptoms of diabetes include frequent urination, frequent drinking, weight loss despite normal or increased appetite, fatigue, tiredness, possible nausea or vomiting, and possible behavioral changes. So the causes of type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition that can develop at any age. While the immune system attacks the pancreas is not known. Genetic tendencies and the environment may play a role in why an individual develops type 1 diabetes. Scientists are working on answering the why. Even though the why is unknown, we do know that a person with type 1 diabetes must take insulin every day to stay alive. It is important to remember that diabetes is not your fault. So let's look at how glucose builds up in the bloodstream. One, the stomach changes food into glucose. Two, glucose enters the bloodstream. Three, the pancreas makes little or no insulin. Four, little or no insulin enters the bloodstream. And five, glucose builds up in the bloodstream. As you can see in this figure, when glucose builds up in the bloodstream and insulin is not allowed into the cells, it creates the condition known as diabetic ketoacidosis. The most common form of diabetes is type 2. It occurs mainly in adults, but with the increase in childhood obesity rates, children are also developing type 2 diabetes. A child is more likely to develop type 2 diabetes if he or she has the following risk factors family history of type 2 diabetes, overweight or obese, a non-active lifestyle, race ethnicity backgrounds including African American, Asian American, Hispanic Latino, American Indian, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. In type 2 diabetes, the pancreas is still producing some insulin. However, the body's cells do not respond as they should. This is called insulin resistance. When the cells are resistant, it takes more and more insulin to move glucose into, the, into blood cells. This extra insulin may keep the blood sugar close to normal for many years, but type 2 diabetes is a progressive condition. Eventually, the pancreas cannot keep up with the demand for more insulin and burns out. When there is not enough insulin produced by the pancreas, the blood glucose level increases. Over the years, the pancreas may stop making insulin altogether. In the figure below, we discuss the type 1 and type 2 diabetes differences. In type 1 diabetes, the pancreas stops making insulin. The treatment must include daily insulin. About 10% of all cases of diabetes, they are more common in children. And in type 1 diabetes, there's no family history most of the time. In contrast, type 2 diabetes, the pancreas produces insulin, but the body cells cannot use the insulin properly. Insulin may be necessary at time of diagnosis. Treatment always includes diet and exercise. Medications are often used, insulin and or oral medications. About 90% of all diabetes cases are type 2. It's more common in adults. And in type 2 diabetes, there is a family history most of the time. So, how is a diagnosis made? Ways to diagnose type 1 or type 2 diabetes. A fasting plasma sugar test. For this test, a person fasts overnight. Blood is drawn from the vein and tested. If the sugar level is 126 milligrams per deciliter or higher, this is considered a positive test for diabetes. An oral sugar tolerance test, or OGTT. For this test, a person fasts overnight. After the person drinks a solution of 75 grams of sugar dissolved in water, blood is drawn from the vein and tested. If the sugar level is 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher, this is positive for diabetes. A random blood sugar test. For this test, 
Blood can be drawn at any time. Blood is drawn from the vein and tested. If the sugar level is 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher, and the person has classic symptoms of diabetes, such as excessive thirst and excessive urine output and weight loss, this is positive for diabetes. Hemoglobin A1C test. For this test, blood can be drawn at any time. Blood is drawn from the vein or fingertip and tested. If the A1C results are equal to or greater than 6.5%, this test is positive for diabetes. So, I have diabetes, now what? Living with diabetes is not easy. The choices you make will have an impact on your blood sugar levels each day. But diabetes can be managed. Diabetes is a self-managed disease. Taking care of your diabetes means making healthy food choices, being physically active, monitoring your blood sugar, and taking your medications. All people with type 1 diabetes need insulin. Read all of this book to learn how to manage your diabetes. It may not be easy, but you can do it. Our goals of treatment. The goal of taking care of your diabetes is to feel well today, to keep doing the things that you enjoy, and to avoid complications in the future. Our short-term goals. Keep blood sugars as close to 80 to 180 as possible. Avoid extreme, low, or high blood sugars. Our long-term goals. Keep your child healthy with normal growth and development and prevent long-term complications from elevated blood sugars. So let's look at blood sugar monitoring. Our example today is of a car. If you drive a car, you already have experience using monitors. When driving, you look at the instrument panel to tell you what the next step should be. To know how fast you are going, you look at the numbers on the speedometer. If you see that you are going above the speed limit, your target, you step on the brake. If you need to speed up, you step on the accelerator. To know your fuel level, you look at your gas gauge. If it is low, you stop at the gas station and refuel. If you see the engine light come on, you know something needs attention and probably will call a mechanic. If you drove your car without a speedometer, gas gauge, or engine light, sooner or later you would get a ticket for speeding, or you would run out of gas, or your car would break down. Trying to manage diabetes without monitoring is like driving a car without these instruments. You may be able to go along okay for a while, but sooner or later, the lack of information and not taking corrective action will lead to serious health complications. Your blood sugar monitor is your instrument panel. Knowing what the monitoring results mean will help guide your next steps. So why is it important to check my blood sugar? Checking can help you reach your target blood sugar. Keeping blood sugar near, near normal most of the time helps lower the chance of complications. It helps you to know how much insulin to take. It helps you to know whether you need a snack before an activity or before bed. It can help you learn how activity and exercise affect your blood sugar. It can help you and your healthcare provider know whether any changes are needed in your medications. So, when do I check my blood sugar? Before meals and bedtime. Any time the symptoms of a low blood sugar are felt. And any time any unusual symptoms occur, such as frequent urination or frequent vomiting. Important. Food should not be eaten within two hours before testing glucose levels. Always bring your logbook and glucose meter to each clinical visit. Now let's go through some steps of how to check your child's blood sugar. Step one, make sure your child's hands are washed and dried. Step two, insert lancet into lancing device. Step three, insert test strip into meter. Make sure the blood sample screen appears. Step four, prick finger for blood sample with lancing device. Use the sides of the finger. Switch fingers with each test. Step five, place the end or side of the test strip to the edge of the blood sample. The test strip will draw in the blood. Step six, record blood sugar and amount of insulin given in logbook. For some meters, you may need to use control solution with the first strip of every new bottle of test strips. 
your blood sugar log helps you keep track of blood sugar patterns. Target ranges for blood sugar. Before breakfast, a good blood sugar is between 70 and 140. A fair blood sugar is between 140 and 200. And anything over 200 needs improvement. Two hours after a meal, a good blood sugar is less than 160. A fair blood sugar is less than 200. And again, anything over 200 needs improvement. Before meals, a good blood sugar is 70 to 140. Fair blood sugar is 140 to 200. And anything over 200 needs improvement. Bedtime and 2 a.m. A good blood sugar for this time is 100 to 140. A fair blood sugar is 140 to 200. And anything over 200 needs improvement. If you look at the figures in the middle of the page, figure A illustrates normal blood sugar, and figure B illustrates high blood sugar. In the illustrations, the red buttons represent red cells, and the yellow buttons represent glucose or sugar. Illustration A shows normal, and illustration B shows high. Hemoglobin A1C. What is this? The A1C is a measure that gives us an idea of your average blood sugar levels for the past three months. It may also be reported as an estimated average blood sugar, or EAG. If you look at the figure on the right-hand side, a hemoglobin A1C percent level of 5 equates to an average sugar level of 90. If we go down to the purple section, a hemoglobin A1C percent of 8 equates to an average sugar level of 180. And if we go all the way down in the red section, a hemoglobin A1C percentage of 14 equates to an average sugar level of 360. Insulin. Normally, the pancreas releases a small amount of insulin in a slow, steady stream throughout the day. This is called basal insulin. When food is eaten, the carbohydrates are broken down into sugar. When you begin to eat and your sugar goes up, a burst of insulin, also known as bolus insulin, is released from the pancreas into the bloodstream. Insulin moves the sugar from the bloodstream into the body cells. Cells use sugar for energy. When a person has type 1 diabetes, the body cannot make insulin. Insulin is needed to regulate blood sugar levels and maintain life. Why do you need insulin injections? Your pancreas is not producing insulin or producing enough insulin. Insulin cannot be taken by mouth because it is destroyed in the stomach by the digestive juices. Insulin injections can be given by syringe and needles, insulin pen, or an insulin infusion pump. Our strengths of insulin. Insulin is measured in units. All insulin is a liquid. The standard and most commonly used strength in the United States today is U100. This means it has 100 units of insulin per one milliliter of fluid. Insulin sometimes comes in other strengths. Let's look at the types of insulin. Our rapid-acting insulin, also known as bolus insulin, comes in these different forms. Lispro, glycerin, faster-acting aspart, Lispro, and regular aspart. Pre-mixed, we have Humalog, mixed in a 75 to 25 ratio. We have Humulin, mixed in the 70 to 30 ratio. Novolog, mixed in 70 to 30 ratio. Our short acting insulin is also called regular insulin. Intermediate acting insulin is known as NPH. Our long acting insulins, also called basal insulin, are Glargine, Detamir, and Degludec. In the figure on the bottom right-hand side, you will notice a scale 
charting plasma insulin levels perpendicular against hours horizontal. Aspart, Lispo, and Glulacine are the shortest acting for only lasting about four hours, peaking around one. Regular insulin lasts a little bit longer, going to roughly nine hours, peaking around two. NPH drops off at 18 hours, peaking around six. Detamir, our long-acting insulin, lasts roughly 20 hours and peaks around 12. Glarine rises and peaks at two hours and remains steady past 24. Insulin activity. There are many types of insulin and they work at different times after they are injected. Onset of action. When the insulin first starts to lower the sugar levels. Peak. The time when insulin is most active. Duration. How long the insulin continues to lower blood sugar in the body. Usually, you need two different types of insulin to treat type 1 diabetes. You need a long-acting basal insulin and a short-acting bolus insulin. In the chart in the middle, we look at which insulin to use and when to take it. Our types of insulin. Fastest acting is our FIOSP. When do we take this? It is taken with meals before or up to 20 minutes after starting a meal and to correct high blood sugar. The onset of FIOSP is two and a half to four minutes. The main effect is 90 minutes and the duration is three to four hours. Fast acting, Humalog, Novolog, Apidra, and Admalog. When to take this? Taken with meals and to correct a high blood sugar. The onset of fast-acting insulin is 20 minutes. The main effect is 90 minutes, and the duration is three to four hours. Long-acting insulin, Lantus, Basaglar, Traceba, and Levomir. When do we take this? It's taken once a day, usually at bedtime. The onset of action for long-acting insulin is one to two hours. The main effect can either be 2 to 22 hours or 2 to 20 hours. Duration, 24 hours to between 20 and 24 hours. Long-acting insulin helps power your body throughout the day. Drawing up insulin and giving an injection. Supplies that you will need include an insulin bottle, an insulin syringe, an alcohol swab, and a container for used syringe. Step one, wash your hands. Step two, check the expiration date on the insulin bottle. Step three, wipe the rubber top of the bottle with an alcohol swab. Step four, pull air into the syringe by pulling back on the plunger until its black tip is even with the line showing the dose you'll need. Step five, push the needle through the rubber top of the insulin bottle. Step six, push the air into the bottle. Step seven, turn the insulin bottle and syringe upside down and pull the insulin into the syringe slowly until the top of its black tip is even with the line showing your insulin dose. Step eight, be sure there are no air bubbles in the syringe. Even small air bubbles may affect the total amount of insulin given. Step nine, gently pinch the skin. Hold the syringe at a 90 degree angle to the skin and push the needle all the way in. Storage of insulin. Unopened insulin should be kept refrigerated between 36 degrees Fahrenheit and 46 degrees Fahrenheit and protected from light. Refrigerated, unopened insulin can be used until the printed expiration date. Room temperature insulin, even if unopened, must be discarded after one month. Opened insulin that is in use at home or traveling should be stored at room temperature less than 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Most brands are good for one month at room temperature after opening. Throw away after 30 days even if some insulin is left in the vial. It is okay to keep the vial you are using in the refrigerator. Cold insulin can be uncomfortable for injections. 
Never warm insulin in the microwave or by floating in hot water, as this will harm the insulin. Never freeze insulin. If it has been frozen, do not use. Do not keep insulin in the car. It may get too hot or too cold. Injection sites. Insulin is injected into the fat layer just under the skin. The sites that insulin is to be injected into are as follows. Arms. Use the back of the upper arms. Abdomen. Avoid belly button area by two finger spaces. Legs. Use the outer thighs. Buttocks. Anywhere that doesn't touch the bottom of a chair when seated. It is very important to rotate the site of your insulin injection. If you continue to give your insulin in the same site, a fatty deposit known as a lipodystrophy may form. When this happens, insulin may not be absorbed properly and your blood sugar will be too high. How to give an insulin injection. Find a large pinch of skin on one of the four areas listed on page 13. If the pinch hurts, you are pinching too hard or the pinch is too small. Inject the needle straight into the top of the pinch. Inject the insulin slow and steady until the plunger is all the way down. Count slowly to four or five and release the pinch. Remove the needle. Injecting into the same area too many times can cause scar tissue to develop. Medicine injected into scar tissue will not be absorbed and will not work. Needle safety. Syringes and needles should be used only once. Reuse syringes and needles are not sterile. Never share used syringes and needles with anyone else. You can pass diseases or spread infection by sharing needles. Disposal of needles and sharps. Place used needles in puncture-proof plastic containers, bleach bottle, liquid detergent bottle, etc. You can also purchase a safety needle box from pharmacies, known as Sharps containers. Dispose of bottle in non-recyclable household trash. How to use an insulin pen. Box one, remove the cap. Wipe the rubber stopper with an alcohol pad. Box two, attach a new needle. Remove the paper tab from needle. Push and twist the needle onto pin until it's tight. Remove both needle caps. Box three, give an air shot before each injection. Turn the dose selector to two units. Press and hold the injector button. Look for a drop of insulin. If no drop of insulin, repeat air shot. Box four, select desired dose. Turn the dose selector to the number of units you need to inject. Box five, inject the insulin. Insert the needle press and hold the injection button. After the dose counter reaches zero, count to six and then remove. Box six. After the injection, remove the needle and place in Sharps container. Put the pen cap back on. Never store the pen with the needle on. Carefully replace outer shield, unscrew capped needle, then dispose in Sharps container. Hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. Hypoglycemia is an abnormally low blood sugar. In order to function, the body must have sugar to produce energy. Blood sugar is the main source of fuel for the brain. Low blood sugar can come on quickly and must be treated. Early treatment prevents severe reactions and possible hospitalization. Hypoglycemia is defined as any blood glucose level lower than 70 milligrams per deciliter. Symptoms of hypoglycemia include shaking, hunger, fast heartbeat, anxiety, irritability, weakness and fatigue, dizziness, impaired vision, headache, and sweating. Severe low blood sugar. If you are unable to take food or liquid by mouth, a family member or friend will need to give you a glucagon injection. Make sure your family and friends know where your glucagon kit is stored. Keep in mind the glucagon kit has an expiration date stamped on the back. Check the date regularly. Treating a low, the rule of 15. If you feel shaky, hungry, sweaty, or irritable, also cranky, do the following. 
One, check your blood sugar. Two, if you are low, less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, eat 15 grams of carbohydrates. Three, wait 15 minutes and recheck your blood sugar. Four, if you are still low, less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, repeat the process, steps two and three. Five, once blood sugar is over 70, eat a meal or a small snack if your next planned meal is more than an hour away. Examples of 15 grams of carbohydrates include half a cup of juice, one cup 1% or skim milk, half cup 1% chocolate milk, three to four glucose tablets, 10 to 15 Skittles, or three teaspoons of sugar. In our glucagon emergency kit, step-by-step -step instructions are given. It is important that you and your family members or friends read these instructions carefully. Step one, remove the flip-off seal from the bottle of glucagon. Two, remove the needle protector from the syringe and inject the entire contents of the syringe into the bottle of glucagon. Step three, remove the syringe and gently shake bottle until liquid is clear. Step four, using the same syringe, draw the glucagon into the syringe to the prescribed dose. Step five, insert the needle into your child's thigh or hip and inject half an ml if the person is less than 40 pounds. Inject all, or one ml, if the person is greater than 40 pounds. Withdraw the needle from the skin. Turn your child onto his or her side in case of nausea and vomiting. Step six, call 911. Preventing low blood sugars. Follow these tips to prevent low blood sugars. Eat meals and snacks on time. Pay attention to early warning signs to avoid further symptoms. Eat extra snacks for heavy exercise or extended activity. Carefully calculate dose and accurately draw insulin dose. Make sure blood sugar is 100 milligrams per deciliter or above at bedtime. If you look at the box on the left hand side, we see low blood sugar symptoms and responses. Categories of low blood sugars are on the top. The patient statuses are on the left going down. If our low blood sugar category is mild, the patient status is alert. The symptoms are shaking, sweating, hunger, tired, weak, and pale. Our actions to take include check blood sugar, give 15 to 20 grams of fast acting carbs, which are four ounces of fruit juice, four ounces regular soda, five to eight lifesavers, three to four glucose tablets, three packets of sugar. Recheck blood sugar in 15 to 20 minutes. Repeat carbs if blood sugar is still low and retest in 15 minutes. If repeated blood sugar is above 70, give a carbohydrate and protein snack, crackers and cheese or peanut butter. If our low blood sugar category is moderate, patient status is not alert. They may be unable to drink safely, which puts them at a choking risk, and they may need help from another person. Symptoms for moderate include unable to focus, headache, confusion, disorientation, and feeling out of control. The patient may be biting or kicking. Actions to take include check blood sugar, give glucose gel or cake decorating gel, put between gums and cheek and rub in. Watch for person to wake up. Recheck blood sugar in 15 minutes. When alert, follow actions under mild column. Our low blood sugar category of severe, the patient status would be unresponsive. Loss of consciousness, seizure, the patient may need constant help from an adult. We are to give nothing by mouth if we have a severe low blood sugar. Symptoms include loss of consciousness and seizure. Actions to take, place child on their side, Check blood sugar, give glucagon if unable to swallow, give with syringe. See previous page for instructions on glucagon administration. Dosage, half an ml if less than 40 pounds, one ml if greater than 40 pounds. After this is done, please call 911. Now, let's look at treatments for high blood sugar. 
So what are reasons for high blood sugar? These can include too little insulin, incorrect timing of insulin, infection or sickness, too little activity, eating too many carbohydrates without enough insulin. Children will also outgrow their insulin dose and have high sugar values. The onset of hyperglycemia may be gradual and progress to diabetic coma. Symptoms of hyperglycemia include extreme thirst, frequent urination, dry skin, drowsiness, blurred vision, hunger, decreased healing, and weight loss. How do we treat your child's high blood sugar? Step one, encourage your child to drink water. Step two, if three hours since the last insulin dose, give corrective insulin. Step three, do not give insulin more often than every three hours. This can cause stacking of insulin and lead to low blood sugars. Step four, send your child's blood sugars via my chart or email when you see high blood sugars. Allow up to three days for review. Step five, high blood sugar does not mean you have done something wrong. Your diabetes educator will look at the blood sugars and talk with you about the patterns. Our goal is to help improve your child's diabetes control. If your blood sugar is greater than 300 or you have an upset stomach or illness, check your urine for ketones. Then do the following. Call your diabetes team at the call emergency line, 423-778-5437. If ketones are moderate to large, stomach pain, or your child has nausea or vomiting, then encourage them to drink water or sugar-free liquids. Diabetic ketoacidosis. Untreated high blood sugars may lead to diabetic ketoacidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, is life-threatening. It happens when too many ketones build up in the body. It can occur within a few hours if sick or if insulin doses are missed. DKA can still be a problem even if insulin brings down the blood sugar reading. Giving insulin breaks the cycle of making more ketones. Fluids, either drinking fluids or receiving IV fluids, help flush the ketones out of the body through our urine. Signs of diabetic ketoacidosis. Nausea or vomiting, stomach pain, rapid or labored breathing, fruity odor to the breath, severe dehydration, very tired or difficult to wake up, and headache. If left untreated, your child can go into a coma. Ketone testing. What are ketones? Without enough insulin, we can't use sugar for energy. Ketones are byproducts of the breakdown of fat. The body breaks down fat when sugar is unavailable in the cell. The liver will change fat to ketones. Ketones are acids, poisons, and can cause illness if too high in the blood. If you produce too many ketones, you may feel sick. So when should I test? When your blood sugar is more than 300 milligrams per deciliter. If you feel sick to your stomach or vomiting or have abdominal pain. When you are sick, for example, with a cold or flu. If you feel tired all the time. If you have a hard time breathing. When your breath smells fruity. If you feel confused or in a fog. Call 423-778-5437 to reach the pediatric diabetes doctor on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How to test for ketones. One, get a sample of your urine in a clean cup. Two. Place this strip in the sample. You also can pass the strip through your urine stream. Three, gently shake excess urine off the strip. Four, wait 15 seconds for the strip pad to change color. Five, compare the strip pad to the color chart on the strip bottle. This gives you a range of the amount of ketones in your urine. A ketone strip test. Keep ketone testing strips at home and at school. Don't wait until you're sick to buy a bottle of strips. Check the expiration date every six months, as out-of-date strips may be inaccurate. Results will either be negative, trace, small, moderate, or large. This is an example of urine test strips. Negative is a beige color. 
Trace is pink. Small, light purple. Moderate, dark purple. Violet is large. Large is violet. Call the diabetes team immediately if ketone strip results are moderate or large. Reading the results of urine test strips. Less than 0.6 millimoles per liter equals negative. 0.6 to 1.55 millimoles per liter equals trace or small. And greater than 1.5 millimoles per liter equals moderate or large. To note, some meters can test for ketones by blood. You test for blood ketones the same way you check your blood sugar levels. Actions to correct your sugar levels. Trace or small, pink to light purple. Drink plenty of sugar-free fluids like water. If you are sick and your urine shows trace or small amounts of ketones, that is not so bad. Even people who don't have diabetes show ketones in their urine when they are sick. Follow your sick day plan, which includes drinking plenty of fluids and test your blood sugar and urine ketones again in three to four hours. Give insulin correction doses if your blood sugar is high. Moderate or large, dark or purple to violet. If your urine has moderate or large amounts of ketones, know your blood sugar level, give an insulin correction, and drink water, 8 to 16 ounces per hour. Take correction every 2 to 3 hours. If vomiting or unable to drink or eat, go to the local emergency room. Day 2. So what about food? A proper diet is an important element of managing your child's diabetes. Understanding the different types of foods and how they affect blood sugar is necessary to an effective diabetes treatment plan. With this knowledge in hand, you can better meal plan for your child. Meal planning basics. Food is made up of carbohydrates, protein, and fats. Carbohydrates are the part of food that has the biggest effect on blood sugar levels. Carbohydrates make your blood sugar go up. Everyone needs some carbohydrates to function normally. There are a lot of carbohydrates in sweets. The goal is to limit concentrated sweets such as juice, sweet tea, regular soda, Sunny D, Gatorade, ice cream, cakes, cookies, and candy. All people, those who have diabetes and those who do not, should limit concentrated sugars. Diet and exercise are extremely important factors in controlling blood sugar levels. Your dietitian will help you understand how to plan healthy meals. If you look at the figure on the right hand side, food is made up of carbohydrates, fruits, vegetables, and grains, proteins, which include meats, peanut butter, eggs, and cheeses, and fats, oils, nuts, and even from some fruits and meats. If you look at the figure on the left hand side, it is split up between foods that affect blood sugars and foods that do not. Foods that do affect blood sugars include grains, such as bread, cereal, pasta, or rice, fruits and fruit juices, starchy vegetables, which include beans, corn, peas, and potatoes, and dairy, including milk, yogurt, and yogurt drinks. On the right-hand side, foods that do not affect blood sugars are proteins, which include meats, tofu, eggs, peanut butter, cheese, and nuts, and fats, including oils, butter, margarine, and salad dressing. General food guidelines. Do not try to maintain a low carb or no carb diet. Growing children need carbohydrates. Avoid buying separate food for your child with diabetes compared to others in the household. Keep a healthy diet for all members in the home. It can be very hard to resist sweets and junk food if it is in the home and others are eating it. Don't use food as a reward. Eat a well-balanced diet. Make half of your plate fruits and vegetables. Make a fourth of your plate grains. Make a fourth of your plate protein. Include low-fat dairy. Limit pure sugar foods such as candy, soda, or fruit juices. Increase fiber by eating whole grains and whole fruits and vegetables. Now we look at healthier meal and drink choices. On the left hand side we look at things that we need to avoid and may not be so healthy for us. And on the right hand side we see things we can enjoy 
and are healthy choices. On the left, beverages to avoid include regular soda, such as Sprite, Dr. Pepper, and Pepsi, juice, even 100 cent juice drink, lemonade and sweet tea, Kool-Aid, Powerade, and Gatorade. Breakfast, not so healthy, would include Pop-Tarts, toaster strudel, and sugary cereals. A lunch that's not so healthy would include large portion of chicken nuggets and fries, grilled cheese and potato chips, or pizza or bacon cheeseburger with soda. A dinner that's not so healthy looks like large spaghetti plate and garlic bread, country fried steak and large serving of rice. Snacks that are not so healthy include icing, frosting, candy such as Skittles, Sour Patch Kids, M&Ms, fruit gummies, etc., ice cream and milkshakes, and ramen noodles. Now we look at beverages to enjoy. Water, diet soda, such as Diet Sprite, Diet Pepsi, etc. Sugar-free beverages, including Crystal Light, sugar-free drink mixers, unsweet tea, etc. And Powerade Zero and Gatorade G2. A healthy breakfast might look like eggs, unsweetened oatmeal with fresh fruit, whole wheat waffle with peanut butter, fruit, and yogurt. A healthy lunch might look like small portion of chicken nuggets with dinner roll, vegetables, and fruit. A turkey sandwich with baked chips or crackers, vegetables, and apple slices. A healthy dinner may look like spaghetti with meat sauce, salad, and fruit, grilled steak with rice, vegetables, and fruit. A healthy snack may look like carrots, bell peppers, celery, cucumbers, whole fruit like apples, peaches, or oranges, cheese, eggs, unsweetened nuts and seeds, and beef jerky. So what are carbohydrates? Carbohydrates are your body's main energy source. During digestion, sugar, simple carbohydrates, and starches, complex carbohydrates, break down into blood sugar, which is known as glucose. If you consume too much carbohydrate-rich food at one time, your blood sugar levels may rise too high. Keeping track of your carbohydrate intake is a very important step to blood sugar control. Carbohydrates are found in lots of different foods, but the healthiest carbohydrate choices include whole grains, vegetables, fruits, beans, and low-fat dairy products. Foods that contain carbohydrates are starchy foods like bread, cereal, rice, pasta, and crackers, fruit and juice, milk and yogurt, dried beans like pinto beans, black beans, and kidney beans, starchy vegetables like potatoes, peas, and corn, non-starchy vegetables such as green beans, carrots, broccoli, tomatoes, okra, cabbage, greens, cucumbers, and cauliflower, sweets and snack foods like soda, juice drinks, cake, cookies, candy, chips, and ice cream. Carbohydrate counting. Your diabetes meal plan will either be a fixed carbohydrate goal or an insulin to carbohydrate ratio. If your child is zero to six months, feed on demand every three to four hours. If your child is six to 12 months, feed three meals and three snacks, no juices. If your child is one to three years old, feed 25 to 40 grams carbohydrates per meal feed less than six grams of snacks between meals and at bedtime. If your child is between four and seven years old, feed 35 to 50 grams of carbohydrates per meal. If your child is between eight and 12 years old, feed them 50 to 65 grams of carbohydrates per meal. And if your child is between 13 and 18 years of age, feed 65 to 85 grams of carbs per meal. Note, these are initial carbohydrate goals. Your registered dietitian will give you an individualized meal plan and your own carbohydrate goals. Insulin to carb ratio. As you gain experience with carb counting, your team may suggest that you use an insulin to carbohydrate ratio. An insulin to carb ratio is individualized and provides more flexibility in how many carbohydrates you eat per meal. The ratio will help you give your child the appropriate amount of insulin for the number of carbohydrates he or she is eating. 
An example, if your insulin to carb ratio is 1 to 15, then you give one unit of insulin for every 15 grams of carbohydrate eaten. In the chart in the middle of the page, our counting carb example is breakfast. One egg is zero grams, a slice of toast is 15 grams, one tablespoon of sugar-free jelly is five grams, one teaspoon of butter is zero grams, 17 grapes is 15 grams, one cup low-fat milk is 12 grams, for a total gram carbohydrate of 47 grams. So if we are to calculate our insulin to carb ratio of one to 15, we have 47 grams of carbs over 15 equals three. We would administer three units of insulin. To help measure your food, you can use measuring cups or a food scale. There are food scales that simply weigh the food, and there are more elaborate ones that include food databases and calculate the number of carbohydrates based on the food and its weight. In the chart, we have 15 gram carbohydrate choices per serving. Under the breads, grains, and cereals column, one ounce of bread product, one slice of bread, 16 inch tortilla, two hard taco shells, or one small waffle, one mini bagel, or half a biscuit, a third cup of rice, half cup of quinoa or pasta. Check label for different serving sizes. Half cup cooked cereal, cream of wheat, regular oatmeal, or grits. Three quarter cup cold cereal, check label as portion sizes vary. Three cups popped popcorn. Under the fruits and juices column, one small apple, orange, peach, or half a banana. Half cup canned fruit in its own juice. One cup strawberries, raspberries, or melon. Three quarter cup blueberries. Two tablespoons dried fruit. Half cup 100% fruit juice. Under the milk and dairy column, one cup dairy milk, six ounces plain or sugar-free yogurt. Under the vegetables, beans, and legumes column, half cup potato, sweet potato, corn, black-eyed peas, English or sweet peas. Half cup cooked beans, such as lima beans, pinto, black, kidney, or lentils. A third plantain, green or yellow. Three quarter cup butternut squash, half cup acorn squash, half cup carrots, green beans, or broccoli. Under the sweets, desserts, and snacks column, three quarter ounce snack food, such as pretzels, or four to six crackers, one ounce baked chips, potato or tortilla, or 10 pita chips, one ounce regular chips, potato or tortilla, two small sandwich cookies, five vanilla wafers, one tablespoon sugar, honey, or maple syrup, a third cup regular ice cream. Food labels. When eating foods with labels, you will need to look at three sections on the label, the serving size, the servings per container, and total carbohydrates. On the image on the right-hand side, we see nutrition facts. Check the serving size, located at the top of this label. In this instance, the serving size is half a cup, or 40 grams, and the servings per container is 13. Total carbohydrates. In this instance, on this label, our total carbohydrate count is 27 grams per serving. Right above the section in yellow is listed total fat, including saturated fat and trans fat, cholesterol, and sodium. We want to eat less of these. In the bubble on the left-hand side, we see that low-fat foods are good, three grams or less per serving. In the blue bubble, high-fiber foods are good, three grams or more. Cooking from scratch. When cooking foods that do not have a nutrition facts label, it is important to still calculate the number of carbohydrates. Follow the recipe and count carbohydrates for each item. Then total up the number of carbohydrates and divide by the number of servings you made to tell you how many grams of carbohydrates are in each serving. 
In the example listed on page 31, we see a recipe for homemade mac and cheese. This is an example of cooking from scratch. For ingredients, use one box or seven ounces of elbow macaroni, a quarter cup fat-free half and half, 10 ounces light processed cheese loaf cubed, such as Velveeta cheese, one and a half teaspoons of butter flavor sprinkles, such as butter buds, and a eighth teaspoon pepper. Directions. Fill a two quart pan two thirds full of water. Bring to a boil, add macaroni, stir, and cook until tender, about six to eight minutes. Drain well. Add half and half cubed processed cheese, butter flavor sprinkles, and pepper to the macaroni. Place over low heat and cook until cheese is melted. Gently stir periodically. This makes five cups. Serving size is half a cup. Nutrition facts per serving. Calories, 135. Carbohydrates, 19. Protein, 8 grams. Fat, 3 grams. Saturated fat, 2 grams. Sodium, 445 milligrams. And fiber, 1 gram. Our low carb snack guide. Hungry for a snack but don't want to take a shot? Try one of these low carb snacks, five gram carbs or less. Remember, if you eat two to three of these snacks together, it adds up to 10 to 15 grams of carbs, and then a shot may be necessary. A quarter cup mixed nuts, such as almonds, peanuts, pistachios, or walnuts. A quarter cup seeds, such as sunflower or pumpkin. One ounce low-fat cheese, any soft or hard, with two to three baby carrots. One slice lean cold cut turkey or low-fat ham rolled up in a leaf of lettuce. You may add mustard or pickle. Half cup raw vegetables, baby carrots, celery, peppers, cucumber, with half cup cottage cheese, low-fat ranch, or sour cream dip. Half cup low-fat cottage cheese or sour cream with two to three sliced strawberries. Half cup tuna, egg, or chicken salad with light mayo. One cup salad mix with oil and vinegar. Three to four celery sticks with one tablespoon natural peanut butter or cream cheese. One serving sugar-free jello with light whipped cream. One Dannon light and fit carb and sugar control smoothie. One Dannon light and fit carb and sugar control yogurt. One sugar-free popsicle half cup ricotta cheese with cinnamon, vanilla extract, four to three nuts, and Splenda. Three to four pickles or five to six olives with one ounce low fat cheese. Day three, sick days. Gather information. When your child gets sick, your first job is to get the information you need. One, what is the current blood sugar? Two, are there ketones in the urine? Please test every time your child goes to the bathroom when he or she is not well. 3. Is there a fever? 4. Is there any vomiting, nausea, or diarrhea? How to take care of your child on a sick day. Your child still needs to take insulin even when sick. Never stop insulin without speaking to your diabetes healthcare team. Remember to give small sips of liquids frequently. Consider popsicles. The goal is to drink one ounce of fluid per year of age per hour. Being sick usually raises blood sugars, but vomiting or diarrhea may lead to dehydration and or low blood sugars. The recommended type of drink, sugar content, depends on the blood sugar level. If blood sugar is over 200 milligrams per deciliter, give sugar-free liquids such as water, broth, or diet drinks. Correct for high blood sugar as needed but no more than every three to four hours, if ketones are small or negative. If blood sugar is less than 200 milligrams per deciliter, offer fluids that contain carbohydrates such as Pedialyte, juice, sport drinks, or flat soda. The goal here is to raise blood sugar so you can safely give correction insulin to prevent or clear ketones. Test blood sugar and urine ketones frequently. Check them every two to three hours especially if they are running very high or very low. If ketones are present, refer to the ketone sick day guidelines on page 34. Do not leave your child at home. Call your child's pediatrician if your child has a fever over 100.4 Fahrenheit for more than 24 hours. 
if your child has a condition you are concerned about and it is not affecting your child's blood sugar. Go to the nearest hospital if your child has difficulty breathing or having to breathe very deeply. If your child has signs of dehydration, such as unusual sleepiness, or is difficult to wake, has dry mouth and skin, sunken eyes, or if your child goes an unusual amount of time without urinating. You will see your primary care doctor for well visits, annual school and sports physicals, immunizations, and non-diabetes related illnesses. Sick day management guidelines. If your child is experiencing no vomiting, or has trace or small ketones, give basal insulin. Give the usual dose at usual time. Correction bolus, correct blood sugar every four hours. Our carb bolus, cover all carbs. Extra fluids, if blood sugar is less than 200, give sugar containing fluids. If blood sugar is greater than 200, give sugar free fluids, one ounce per year of age. Blood sugar ketone check. Check blood sugar every two hours. Check ketones every trip to the bathroom. If your child has no vomiting, but has moderate to large ketones, give basal insulin at the usual dose at the usual time. Correct blood sugar every two hours. Carb bolus cover all carbs. Our extra fluids and blood sugar ketone check remains the same. If your child is vomiting and or has diarrhea and has trace or small ketones, our basal insulin give the usual dose at the usual time. For our correction bolus, correct blood sugar every four hours. For our carb bolus, post meal dose for carbs to ensure food, drink is kept down, wait about 30 minutes. Our extra fluids and our blood sugar ketone check remains the same. For vomiting and or diarrhea, and if your child has moderate to large ketones, our basal insulin is to give the usual dose at the usual time. Correct blood sugar every two hours. For a carb bolus, post meal dose for carbs to ensure food and drink is kept down. Wait about 30 minutes. Our extra fluids and blood sugar ketone check remains the same. If vomiting two or more times in one hour, go to the nearest emergency room for DKA evaluation. Sick day meal plan. When you can't eat regular foods, eat the following foods. These contain 15 grams of carbohydrates, half cup regular jello, six saltine crackers, three squares of graham crackers, half cup juice, one and one quarter cup regular Gatorade, two-third cup regular Kool-Aid, half cup Sunny Delight or Sunny D. Exercise. Benefits of activity. Regular exercise is important for the child and adolescent with diabetes, just as it is important for all other children and adolescents. In children with diabetes, a regular exercise program helps to control blood sugar levels. The following list explains how exercise affects your body. It helps your body use glucose better. Insulin is more effective during periods of exercise. It helps many people feel better when they exercise regularly. They also tend not to tire as easily. It tends to keep the body in shape and at the appropriate weight. It helps keep cholesterol normal. It strengthens your heart and lungs. Because exercise may lower the blood sugar, it is important that you and your child adjust both the amount of food and insulin required when exercising. The chart below lists basic suggestions for safe, enjoyable exercise. Do the following as a precaution when exercising. Wear a medical ID bracelet or necklace. Exercise with a friend who knows about low blood sugar insulin reaction. And remember to drink water when exercising. What to do when you're active. If your blood sugar before exercise is less than 100 milligrams per deciliter, eat 15 to 30 grams of fast-acting carbohydrates prior to the start of exercise if exercising or playing longer than one hour. If your blood sugar before exercise is between 100 and 150 milligrams per deciliter, eat 15 grams of fast-acting carbs at the start of most exercise. 
if blood sugar before exercise is between 150 and 300 milligrams per deciliter. Eat no carbs unless blood sugar falls below 150 during exercise. And if your blood sugar before exercise is greater than 300 milligrams per deciliter, check for ketones. Negative to small ketones, you may exercise but avoid very intense workouts as this can lead to higher blood sugars. Do not exercise with large ketones present. Take an insulin correction and drink water. A general rule for exercising, eat an extra 15 grams of carbs for every 60 minutes of intense exercise. Exercise tips for success. Check blood sugars before and after exercise to learn the best insulin adjustment for the activity. Always carry rapid acting carbohydrates, glucose tabs, juice box, etc. Try to inject insulin in a non-exercising site. Do not exercise if large ketones are present in the urine. The presence of ketones indicates the need for additional insulin, water, and rest. Make sure coaches and teachers know about your diabetes and how to treat low blood sugar reactions. Drink plenty of water, especially in hot weather. In some instances, you may need to lower the insulin dose prior to the exercise. If there is a planned all-day exercise, such as hiking, boogie boarding, or biking for several hours straight, talk to your doctor about insulin dosing for high activity days. But don't forget to have fun. Frequently asked questions. How will physical activity affect my child's blood sugar? Physical activity and general play, for example, playing at the playground with friends, playing tag, catch, or riding a bike, will usually lower a child's blood sugar. The sugar moves from the blood and into the muscles, where it can be used for energy. Some activities, for example sprinting or weightlifting, may raise the blood sugar first and lower it later due to adrenaline or stress hormones. Should I let my child be active? Absolutely. General activity is good for building endurance, muscle strength, and cardiovascular or heart fitness. Plus, it's fun and may improve mood. We recommend less than two hours a day of total combined screen time, including TV, computer, video games, and cell phone use, and at least one hour of physical activity per day. How will I know if my child is having low blood sugar? Parents often worry about low blood sugars. For infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, it may be more difficult to tell if your child is low. Some signs of low blood sugar include crankiness, falling asleep, temper tantrums, hunger, general fussiness, or unusual behavior. Of course, these things can happen without low blood sugar, so when in doubt, it's best to test the blood sugar. The same symptoms may apply to school-aged children, but they may be more aware and able to tell when they are low. If your child has received insulin and then not finished a meal or a snack, be alert that they may have a low blood sugar. When in doubt, test. What are the best carbs to use? The best carbs would be four ounces of Gatorade, small juice boxes, or a piece of fruit. The sugars from these carbs are available immediately to be used for energy. For longer periods of exercise, you may choose a snack which mixes a little protein or fat, such as a granola bar, or half a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or small apple with peanut butter or cheese. Know which snacks to eat when your blood sugar is low. More frequently asked questions. Are there any activities or situations which may be more likely to cause low blood sugars? Certain activities like running, trampolines, and swimming may burn a lot of calories and cause lows more quickly. Because of safety issues, always test blood sugar before these activities. Active birthday parties, such as indoor trampoline parties, may also burn a lot of calories. Looking for trends in blood sugars is helpful. Different activities affect the blood sugar in different ways, but it is not possible to always predict exactly how your child will respond. As time goes on, you will become familiar with the different effects of various activities. For example, if you notice that every time your child goes swimming after dinner, the blood sugar is low in the middle of the night or in the morning, you can either give a snack with carbs and protein, example, cold cereal and milk, at bedtime or lower the Lantus dose at bedtime by 10 to 20 percent. What about sports and school-aged children? 
In general, younger children playing sports in a recreational setting, such as basketball, baseball, football, or soccer, can test their blood sugar before activity and have an extra 15 gram snack. For high levels of activity lasting more than one hour, test after an hour and give additional snacks as needed. You may also want to test at the end of activity. Some activity, for example, playing outfield baseball, may not be very active and your child may not need additional snacks. Diabetes at school. How to manage diabetes at school. Before school starts, contact the school nurse or principal to tell them your child has diabetes. You may need to schedule a meeting with school staff. Parents or guardians are responsible to keep diabetes supplies at school. Insulin, syringes and pen needles, blood glucose meter, test strips, glucagon, ketone test strips, juice boxes, or glucose tablets. Make sure that the school always has correct parent-guardian contact numbers. Complete a diabetes medical management plan each school year. A diabetes medical management plan. The school must have a written document which outlines how to safely meet the child's daily diabetes self-care needs. The plan needs to be updated every school year. Your diabetes team will give you a new school plan each year. Children with diabetes are protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Talk to your school nurse, counselor, about which form or forms you need to be placed in the child's school. Traveling with diabetes. Whether you are taking a leisurely vacation or going on an adventure, the key requirement for your child to feel great is to be prepared for the expected as well as the unexpected. To help you out, our diabetes team has compiled tips and information to make your child's trip a healthy one. General travel tips. Ask your healthcare provider for a letter explaining your diabetes medications and supplies. Wear a medical identification bracelet that says you have diabetes. Check your blood sugar more often since changes in your routine may affect your blood sugar. Be aware of your blood sugar level when deciding to drive. Do not leave your medications in a car trunk or glove box, in a backpack or cycle bag, or near a window where they may get too hot or cold. Before leaving home, pack your small diabetes supply carry-on bag, including bottle with cap to use as a sharp container, insulin, with syringes, pens, or pump supplies, glucose tablets or other sugar source, blood glucose meter with spare batteries, alcohol wipes or hand washing gel, thermometer, glucagon emergency kit, test strips and lancets, cotton balls or tissues, snacks such as crackers or dried fruit. If you're flying, keep your diabetes supplies with you in your carry-on baggage. Do not pack them into the luggage you are checking. Pack twice as much medicine as needed. Know your health insurance policy regarding emergency care out of state. Get an extra paper copy of prescriptions if your travel will be extended. Make a copy of your emergency phone numbers and insurance cards. Make sure your medication has a prescription label on it. Your local pharmacist may be able to provide you extra labels for travel. If you are traveling across multiple time zones, talk to your doctor about changes in the insulin doses with travel. Plan for hot weather. Do you need Frio bag for insulin? Write down your insulin regimen. Take a copy of sick day management guidelines. During your travel, check your blood sugars often. Keep track of what you eat and drink. Be aware that airplane travel can make you dehydrated. Remember to drink water. Be aware that different activities and climates affect blood sugar. Always wear your medical ID bracelet. When traveling abroad, learn how to say the following phrases in the local language. I have diabetes. I need food or juice. I need a pharmacy. I need a doctor. Consider contacting the local U.S. Embassy or consulate at your destination to let them know your travel dates and times. Call the American Diabetes Association, or ADA, at 206-282-4616 for a list of diabetes providers in the area you will be traveling. If you travel to another country and use insulin bought there, it may have a different strength. You will need to adjust your dosage. 
air travel, and diabetes. The ADA continues to advocate for the rights of travelers with diabetes. Please visit this website and TSA for the most up-to-date information on air travel and diabetes. That is http mainediabetes.org slash dorg slash pdfs slash advocacy slash discrimination slash air dash travel dash and dash diabetes dot pdf. Diabetes care schedule. Follow-up visits. You will have a follow-up visit with your diabetes team every three months. You can expect the following at each visit. Height, weight, blood pressure, and pulse will be checked. Your finger will be pricked to check hemoglobin A1C. Your doctor will do a physical examination. Your blood sugar log and meter will be reviewed. Your insulin dose may be changed. Diabetes education will continue at all visits. Flu vaccine offered in fall, winter of every year. Yearly exams and tests. Screening for autoimmune diseases such as thyroid disease and celiac disease. Dilated eye exam for patients who are 10 years of age or older who have had type 1 diabetes mellitus for five years or more. Urinary test for kidney disease for patients who have had type 1 diabetes mellitus for five years or longer. Blood test to check cholesterol levels for patients starting at 10 years of age. The honeymoon phase. What is the honeymoon phase? Soon after you are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, you may enter what is known as the honeymoon phase. During this time, your insulin needs may decrease. This is because once you start taking insulin, your pancreas is given a chance to rest, and some remaining cells in your pancreas may start to make insulin. This is only temporary. Your child's diabetes has not gone away. It is important to let your child know that they did not do anything wrong when their insulin needs increase. How will you know you are in the honeymoon? You will notice that your blood sugars may start dropping. You should call your diabetes team when you start having low blood sugars. Your doctor will reduce your insulin doses as necessary. Why is it important to take insulin? If you stop taking insulin completely, you might develop diabetic ketoacidosis. Without insulin, your body will produce excess ketones, which will make you sick. Do not stop taking insulin unless your physician tells you to. How long will the honeymoon phase last? Each person with diabetes is different. It may last for weeks, months, and rarely a year or longer. It is important to remember that your diabetes will not go away. Some developmental considerations. If your child is between preschool age and early childhood, between three to six years, they may have concerns such as a hard time understanding how and why sickness happens. They like meeting new people, but feel safest around family. They may regress in behavior. Strategies. Play is the best outlet for coping. Use holding, rocking, distraction, such as pop-up books or music, and blowing to help with shots and blood sugar checks. Reassure your child that he or she did nothing wrong. Example, nothing you did made you get diabetes. Offer simple choices when possible. Example. You can get your shot on your arm or leg today. You pick. For a child in middle childhood years, between 7 and 11, they may be worried about missing out on play activities in school. They may be worried about being seen as different by peers. They may not be sure what to tell friends and wonder if they will treat me differently. They may feel concerned about the fairness of having diabetes. Why me? Or it's not fair. They may be concerned about their body won't work the same or will be different. Strategies are drawing pictures and writing stories. This may help a child express his or her feelings. Listen, empathize, and let your child know his or her concerns are normal. Don't argue, dismiss, or explain them. Just listen. Offer choices when possible. Be concrete with information and explanations. Reassure a child that he or she did nothing to get diabetes. Coach your child in how to talk to others about diabetes. Make up a script or role. Play practice. Tell your child that others might be worried or scared and may ask questions. If your child is of adolescent age, some concerns, 
They may get frustrated because of lack of control or privacy. They may feel modest about their bodies. They may worry about their, what their peers think. Food is a very important part of their social lives. They may have an adult understanding of things, but limited judgment and self-control. Some strategies. Negotiate when possible. Be clear that diabetes is a family matter. Support problem solving and focus on successes. Why did that work so well? Developmental ages and expectations. Family sharing of responsibility for diabetes management. Children of a certain age can vary tremendously in learning ability, judgment, and maturity. Don't encourage independent self-care based on age alone. Do not give children too much responsibility for diabetes management. Since it's hard to match the children's self-care responsibility with maturity, err on the side of too much adult responsibility rather than too little. Most children will want to do tasks when they are ready. It is important not to rush your child and to remember that motivation and interest can vary from day to day. The best way for parents to prepare their child for eventual self-management is to stay involved and to work closely and collaboratively with him or her through adolescence. Communicate clearly and often with your child, your significant other, and your diabetes team about who is responsible for each aspect of diabetes care. Life with diabetes presents many opportunities for problem solving. Your job is to help your child become an active problem solver who is able to cope with and manage diabetes problems as opposed to avoiding them or feeling resentful and overwhelmed by them. Developmental readiness for diabetes management. If your child is under eight years of age, the parent does all the tasks. The child's job is to cooperate. It is okay to allow a child to do small tasks under close supervision such as selecting the finger to use for a blood check. If your child is between 9 and 11 years of age, begin teaching the child how to do some tasks, if interested. Adult always supervises and is always ready to step in. It is okay for a child to ask the parent to do any diabetes tasks. If your child is between 12 and 14 years of age, the young teen begins doing tasks with adult supervision. The parent still watches all tasks. Many teens may still not be ready at this age. Parent works to limit conflict and help to set goals and problem solve. If your child is between 15 and 18 years of age, older teens begin doing these tasks independently, but ideally still under adult supervision. The teen is increasingly responsible for communicating with the healthcare team. The parent can fade out monitoring over time, but should step back if control worsens by asking teen, what can I do to help? Some teens may continue to need extra help. Give them permission to ask for help. Children's developmental understanding of diabetes, concerns, and misconceptions at diagnosis. Common misconceptions. Children often have mistaken ideas about diabetes depending upon their age or development, which can include, it's my fault I have diabetes. I must have done something wrong, like eat too much sugar. Shots or blood checks are punishment for being bad. Sugar and sweets are bad. You can catch diabetes or give it to someone else. I am going to die because I have diabetes. Emotional coping. The period following a diabetes diagnosis can be a time of crisis for some families. Most children and parents feel emotional pain at diagnosis and can experience some emotional low points along the way. Healthy emotional adjustment to diabetes is a process, not an event. Common feelings at diagnosis, guilt or blame. No one gene is known to cause diabetes and no one side of the family is responsible for it. There are many unanswered questions about the causes of diabetes. It is nobody's fault. Denial. While many view denial as negative, it can be a natural response to diagnosis and can serve to protect children and families from becoming overwhelmed. Denial can become a problem when it gets in the way of safe diabetes management. Anger and resentment. Children and parents sometimes feel anger at the injustice of diabetes. Anxiety, fear. Many parents worry about the long-term complications of diabetes, particularly if they have had experiences with family, friends with complications. Parents and children can also worry about low blood sugar reactions or safety at school 
or went away from home. Loss, grief, and sadness. Parents naturally want to protect their children from harm, burden, and pain. Many children and families grieve for a normal lifestyle or their child's perfect health and wonder if life will ever be normal again. Some experience acute grief reactions, including interruptions in sleep, concentration, and decreased capacity for pleasure and joy. These symptoms tend to decrease over time. All of these feelings are normal and to be expected. It's important to find healthy ways to cope. It's also important to know that children with diabetes and their families do live safe and emotionally satisfying lives. Children's developmental understanding of diabetes concerns and misconceptions at diagnosis continued here. How siblings may feel. Because diabetes invades every aspect of life, it can have an impact on siblings. Some common reactions may include jealousy at the perception, real or imagined, that their sibling with diabetes is getting more or special attention. Resentment about impositions, including changes in a family's eating habits, schedules, or finances. Fear of developing diabetes. Worry and guilt, feeling responsible for the onset of diabetes. How to help diffuse negative feelings. Your family will be experiencing changes and a new normal will need to be established. Tune in to your child's behavior and keep the lines of communication open. Talking to them often about how they are feeling allows them to express their emotions and can help relieve stress. Other things you can do that may help lift emotions and relieve stress are include the sibling in the care and treatment of their brother or sister in small ways. Having the sibling attend a doctor visit or help prepare a family meal may give them a better understanding of what their sibling is going through. Giving siblings small ways to contribute can make them feel helpful in regard to the treatment of their sibling's diabetes. Be patient while your child or children who doesn't have diabetes deals with the emotions that will stem from changes the family will make while establishing a new routine. Spend one-on-one -on -one time with your healthy children where the focus is strictly on them. Encourage fun activities. Silliness and laughter are great ways to diffuse stress and bring a family together. Plan a family game night or other group activity. Health complications due to diabetes. When blood glucose remains high over a long period of time due to diabetes, other health problems may arise as a result. Some of the most common health complications are listed below. Diabetic retinopathy or diabetic eye disease. An eye disease in which blood vessels in the retina are damaged that leads to decreased vision and in some cases, blindness. Diabetic nephropathy, or diabetic kidney disease. When the kidney is exposed to high levels of glucose over many years, the part of the kidney that filters blood can become damaged. The filter's job is to separate proteins, waste products, and extra fluid from your blood, then carried out of your body through urine. If the kidney is not able to remove these impurities and the condition is not treated, serious health problems can occur. Dental problems and disease. Having diabetes puts you at risk for mouth problems such as gum disease, chronic bad breath, mouth sores, and loose teeth. Heart and blood vessel disease, cardiovascular diseases. Diabetes greatly increases your child's risk of developing conditions such as peripheral artery disease, which is poor blood flow in the feet and legs, coronary artery disease, heart attack, stroke, narrowing of the arteries, or atherosclerosis, and high blood pressure later in life. Nerve damage or diabetic neuropathy. Over a long period of time, diabetes can cause nerve damage throughout the body, especially in the hands, fingers, legs, and feet. This can cause numbness, tingling, a burning sensation, sharp or aching pain. Pain and discomfort may be mild at first, but can worsen over time. Foot problems. When nerves in your feet become damaged, it's harder for you to feel the pain or discomfort of an injury or sore. If a foot injury or problem goes undetected, it can worsen and increase the possibility of becoming infected. Nerve damage in feet can also affect your ability to control the muscles in your feet, causing problems with the way you walk. Your diabetes doctor will conduct periodic screening tests for your diabetes complications. Following your diabetes management plan and taking an active role in your child's treatment are two important ways you can help prevent or delay diabetic complications. 
Diabetes Resources. The following pages list some of your favorite apps, websites, and online groups for nutrition, diabetes management, fitness, and Facebook groups slash online communities. Nutrition Apps. Carb Counting with Lenny. This app teaches carb counting skills. Featuring a friendly, smart cartoon lion named Lenny, it offers games and other educational activities to help children understand nutrition. Patients and families can browse photos of common foods to learn how many carbs are in each or play a does this have carbs game to rack up points. A food guide highlights healthy food choices and portions. Though aimed at children and young adults, the app may appeal to parents who might find it useful to help keep a kid with diabetes on track. Calorie King. Track calories, carbohydrates, protein, and fiber. This app allows you to compare the nutritional value of foods from a database that includes information about 70,000 foods, 260 restaurants, and fast food chains. Diabetes Management Apps My Sugar or My Sugar Junior Apps Logbook, Blood Glucose Scanner, and Education Sugar Buddy has graphs, logbook, an A1C calendar, push reminders, and doctor printout. Gluco. This app allows you to download your diabetes device data to your iOS or Android device, integrate food and lifestyle data, and share reports with your care team. Tide Pool Blip. This app acts as a hub for your diabetes data. Blip lets you see data from all of your diabetes devices in one place and lets you add data in real time. AccuCheck Connect Diabetes Management App allows you to automatically send test results to an app on your smartphone and an online portal. Automatically tracks results, no more written logbook. View results and trend graphs. Text results to a parent or caregiver. Add meal photos to help estimate carbs. Diabetes emoticons. These were created to make communication with parents and others about diabetes easier. The idea for the diabetes emoticons app was originally developed by two adolescent sisters with type 1 diabetes at a patient-centered design workshop. Facebook groups, online communities, CGM in the cloud, children with diabetes foundation, diabetes community, diabetic connect, also visit the website www.diabeticconnect.com, diabetes daily, parents of children with type 1 diabetes, and Teen Diabetes Support Group. College Resources. The College Diabetes Network, or CDN, is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide innovative, peer-based programs which connect and empower students and young professionals to thrive with diabetes. They also provide information on scholarships for those living with diabetes. Students with Diabetes aims to create a community and connection point for young adults with diabetes ages 18 to 30 on both college campuses and in local communities across the country. Students with diabetes equips young adults with the tools and information they need to succeed, as well as providing professional and social opportunities to create individual networks. College scholarships are available for people with diabetes. Other helpful websites, are kidshealth.org. This site has following short videos. What happens in type 1 diabetes? What happens in type 2 diabetes? Diabetes, how your body gets energy. And diabetes, how insulin is made and works. Childrenwithdiabetes.com. It's an online community providing education and support for kids, families, and adults with diabetes including chats, forums, and Ask the Diabetes Team. 2diabetes.com, diabeticscholars.org, type1nation.org, trials.jdrf.org, diabetes.org, which is the American Diabetes Association, jdrf.org, and think like a pancreas. Dot com. My name is Kayla Smith. I'm a registered nurse with Children's Hospital Erlanger and today I've brought you education on managing diabetes.